Omar, you're a reprehensible man. He, uh, that's my book. Yeah, I, I was, you know, just hanging around the bar last night, as I do. Um, I was, my sister Fajal asked me to come up uh, to, um, you know, have a drink. And there was Omar rising like the serpent out of the ocean, <laughs> bearing his cup of Amrut. But I'm so happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, he asked me to talk about my new book, which I'm um, happy to do. Um, so since Maximum City, for the last 10 years or so, I've been writing a book about New York. But one November morning in 2016, I realized that things had changed in this country that I'm a citizen of. Uh, I've been <clears throat> living in America for now 40 years. I came with my family, including Sejal and my sister Monica and my parents, <coughs> to Jackson Heights in Queens in 1977. And my parents put me in an incredibly racist all-boys Catholic school in Jackson Heights, um, where on the second day of uh, my entrance to uh, Monsignor McLancy Memorial High School, this uh, Irish kid with red hair and freckles comes up to me and says, Lincoln should have never let him off the plantations. And I said, but what's it got to do with me? <laughs> but things got better. With each year, I felt my position in this country um, uh, get more legitimate. Um, I'd go to different countries. I've lived in England, in Brazil, in France. I could never really feel English or French or Brazilian, but each time the plane came back towards JFK and I'd see the Long Island shoreline, I would think this is home, this is where I belong. That changed in November 2016. I have never seen this country so polarized, so at each other's throats. Uh, there's a third of the country that is solidly behind Trump, no matter what he does. And much of um, what's changed is the fear and hatred directed at immigrants, people like us. But it's not just this country, it's worldwide. There's a wave of migrant phobia, uh, of neo-nationalism, of outright fascism in many cases, uh, that's gone all over the Western world, and not just the Western world. So I decided to write a book, this one. Uh, it's a manifesto. It's an argument in favor of global migration. And also what I wanted to do is, you know, so much of the language about immigrants is language like Trump uses about the Mexicans, which is that they're rapists, they're, uh, they're robbers, they're uh, malingerers, they're welfare cheats. Much like some Indians, uh, much like the language some Indians use about Bangladeshis. Um, the English use that about Romanians and Pakistanis. The French use that about Algerians. Uh, the Hungarians use that about just about everyone else. Um, so my book begins with this anecdote that my grandfather once told me. So my grandfather was born in rural Gujarat and left uh, in the salad days of the 20th century for colonial Kenya, where he worked all his life. And then he retired in London, where my uncle was living. So my grandfather is sitting in a park in, uh, outside of Wembley one day in the 1990s, minding his own business. And then this elderly British gent comes up to him and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your country? And my grandfather, who's a good Gujarati businessman, says, because we are the creditors. You came to my country, you stole all my gold and my diamonds, so we have come to collect. <laughs> we are here, my grandfather said, because you were there. I mean, think about it, there's, there's all this talk about, you know, the people who are coming in, are they authorized or not? Uh, do they have permission to come into this country? Do they apply for a visa? Ask yourself this, 
Did the West ever apply for a visa when they went into all these countries throughout the colonial period? <laughs> did, did the West ever ask permission to, not to work, but to invade, to conquer and to loot? So my book's not just polemics. I spent a lot of time um, uh, researching the data. When the British came to India, um, India's share of world GDP was basically a quarter of the world's GDP. By the time they left 200 years later, India's share of world GDP was 4%. It went from a quarter to 4%. percent similar story with China. Um, during the colonial period, the GDP of uh, European countries, of the colonial powers, rose from 20 to 60% of the world's economy. Where did that money come from? And it's not just what they did when they were in these countries. It's the lousy colonial map making they left behind, which is the source of all our problems today, or most of our problems. When the British left India, they left in haste, and they brought down a barrister named Cyril Radcliffe, who'd never been to India, and gave him five weeks to draw two lines down a map. Five weeks. I spoken to people in Lahore, in Punjab, who had no idea which side of the line they would be until a week after independence. They fell on each other. Them neighbors massacred neighbors. And the British did nothing to impose order. You know, the, the, the whole fiasco in Kashmir, I mean, we've, we've been fighting each other now for 70 years. The origins really are not with us. They began in this British policy of divide and rule, which we have now somehow imbibed. We divide and rule ourselves. Um, the second reason that people migrate after colonialism is corporate colonialism. So when the colonial powers left, they left their corporations behind. 40% of all the um, profits of multinationals in developing countries go directly to tax havens. I spent um, time in Bhopal interviewing the survivors of the Union Carbide gas disaster in 1984. Tens of thousands of people died, hundreds of thousands of people maimed. What did Union Carbide do? It lopped off its Indian limb. It basically um, got rid of Union Carbide India, got the hell out of India, and grew another limb somewhere else, and then sold it, itself off to Dow Chemical. So the modern structure of the multinational is like this. It can go into countries at will, and whenever uh, its um, uh, local governments go after them for environmental crimes uh, or some sort of corporate malfeasance, they can just get out of that country and go somewhere else. Um, the third reason that people migrate is conflict, war. We, the United States, went into Iraq and launched an illegal an unnecessary war in which 600,000 Iraqis died. And the entire region was set aflame. I submit that 600,000 Iraqis should now be allowed asylum in the United States. There are all these Syrians, Iraqis, people all across the Middle East who are on the move, basically because of something we did. Um, it's not just the big wars, it's also small arms. Um, all these conflicts in the Northern Triangle countries, um, which is El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, where are the guns coming from? Us. We put 1.8 million guns in uh, El Salvador alone during, uh, to arm the Contras during the Nicaraguan conflict. Uh, We've interfered in the internal politics of these countries for decades. At one point, one American company, the United Fruit Company, owned 42% of all the land in Guatemala. So, you know, these people are coming here, again, the, um, <clears throat> the Latin American migrants, because we were there first and we continue to be there. But the fourth and biggest driver of migration is climate change. By the middle of the century, land that is home to 650 million people today will be underwater. Land that is home to one and a half billion people will be a desert. 
that heat wave in India this year in which 10,000 people roofed it to death? Who created it? The United States put in one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. European countries, another quarter. So when all these desperate people are moving, it's the responsibility of the countries that caused the whole problem in the first place to take them in. But they're not moving from Bangladesh to Bayonne. They're moving from Bangladesh to India. 85% of global migrants move not from a poor to a rich country, but from a poor to a slightly less poor country. They move from Syria to Lebanon. So, uh, so it's an angry book. I wrote this book in response to the present emergency. And also because the fear of migrants in country after country is doing incalculably more damage to these countries than the migrants themselves ever could. It was fear of migrants that caused Trump to be elected, with his promises of build a wall. And now look at the horrendous mess this country is in. It was fear of migrants that caused the biggest own goal in British history, called Brexit. And look at the state of Britain right now. The whole country is about to split apart. It's fear of migrants that causing these neo-fascist parties to emerge in Poland, in Hungary, in Italy, in Germany. So it's an angry book, but with a happy ending. And the happy ending is this. The immigrant armada that is coming to our shores is actually a rescue fleet. Birth rates are falling in country after country. In this country, birth rates fell for the fourth straight year. The replacement fertility rate uh, for a country to retain its level of population is 2.1 babies per woman. In the United States, it's under 1.7. And this is true across the West. And what happens when people don't make enough babies? Well, their populations are aging. As the baby boom retires, we're going to become a nation of geezers. They're going to, people are going to be living longer and retiring. And who's going to pay the social security benefits for these people? Already the social security system is paying out more in benefits than it receives in taxes. In 15 years, you'll only get 80 cents on the dollar of the social security benefits you're entitled to. The only way the system can be saved is through immigrants, because immigrants are younger than the native born, they work longer and harder, uh, and they have more children, which means that uh, the younger people who pay the taxes uh, of these people who are retiring in larger numbers. When people move, everyone benefits. The, the migrants themselves benefit, because for many of them it's literally a matter of life and death. The countries that they move to benefit, um, because they're not making enough babies, um, and the countries that they move from benefit, because if you really want to make the world a better place, if you want to help the poorest of the poor, then let people move because remittances, the money people spend, send back in you know, 1,000, 5,000 rupee increments, they're the best and most targeted way of helping the global poor. Last year, remittances accounted for some $700 billion, remittances into the developing countries. Remittances are, account, amount to four times all the foreign aid given in the world last year. These countries don't need foreign aid. O often foreign aid has the effect of going to the most corrupt local elites. But when people send remittances back to their families to help um, a sister's education, uh, a mother's medical bill to make a house, it's the poor helping the poor back in their families. So global migration is a win-win for just about everyone. And you know, we shouldn't automatically assume that these borders were always a fact of life. Until about 100 years ago, people moved around the world freely. During the age of mass migration, from the middle of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, one-fourth of all of Europe got up and moved en masse to the United States. There were no restrictions on their movement. And what happened? What happened to the United States? It replaced Europe at the pinnacle of world wealth and power. All these countries, there's still enough space. But the, the ways in which the immigration laws are being enforced today are brutal and inhumane. And so in my book, I don't just have numbers and arguments, I have stories, because at heart I'm a storyteller. I'll tell you just one story. There's a place called Friendship Park on the um, 
US-Mexican border, just south of San Diego, and you should all go there. Trump's wall exists in Friendship Park, uh, just, just outside of Tijuana and San Diego. There's a long stretch of wall which goes down the hills and basically ends in the sea. But right where it ends, there's a very small park which was inaugurated by the Nixon administration where families who are on this side of the border who you know, don't have papers can meet their families who are on the other side. And it used to be that they could go and as long as they stayed on this side and those people didn't come here, they could have a picnic with them. They could sit and talk to them. In recent years, Friendship Park um, have been fenced in. So the border control operates it. They will still, well, until last year, they still used to let uh, immigrants go and meet their families. But now through a thick iron mesh fence, there's a, um, so basically it's, uh, it's a section of fence where you can go up and you can put your face up to the fence and see your family that comes from the other side. So I stayed there for two weeks and I saw some of the most heartbreaking scenes of my reporting career. I saw a Mexican man who didn't have papers, who hadn't seen his mother for 17 years. And so he goes up to the fence and there's this, it's like a, um, a double layer of rusted iron fencing. And his mom cups up uh, on the other side and she puts up her face on the fence. And he looks at her, he hasn't seen her for 17 years except on Skype. And he tells her how much he loves her. She tells him how much she misses him. She asks if he's eating right. And the holes in the fence are only big enough to put your pinky finger through. So he puts his pinky finger through, mom puts her pinky finger through, and they do what's called a pinky kiss. All along the fence, their families, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, parents and children, doing this pinky kissing. If you've ever been distanced from someone in your family, if you've ever had a rupture with someone in your family, go to this fence and see what happens when there's a state, a government that keeps you from your family. See how much longing there is when these families meet each other face to face. They hear their breathing. So, it's a brutal game that's being played all over the world. And on Thursday, I'm going to India. I've been invited to the India Today conclave, which is going to be filled with ministers from the Modi government. And I'm going to say the same thing there. We Indians in this country demand equitable treatment for ourselves, and rightly so. But our people are doing the same thing in India to other people. There's a national register of citizens now, which is, it didn't originate with the BJP government, but they're certainly enforcing it. And millions of people are going to lose their citizenship and be put in these detention centers all across the country. And they're going to be, this, in many cases, there are people who are born there, but don't have the right paperwork. Anyone who's ever tried to get a birth certificate out of an Indian hospital or a visa out of the Indian consulate knows what it, uh, paperwork in India entails. It's not a simple procedure. You know, and th there's all these proposals now, and I'm, I heard it from Bal Thakare when I interviewed him in Bombay, uh, this criminalization of Bangladesh, this throwing around of fake statistics generated from Facebook stories. Um, and families are going to be torn apart. It's going to shame us as a nation. But more than that, you ain't seen nothing when it comes to migration. Mass migration driven by climate change is going to be the defining human phenomenon of the 21st century. And the world has no plan to deal with this. When all these people are going to be moving from Bangladesh to India, from Latin America to here, from Africa, which is actually where the biggest population uh, bulge is going to happen in this century. We have no coordinated plan to accommodate these people. Whole island nations are going to be underwater. 
What are we going to do? Shoot at women and children if they come across the borders? Well, we're already doing that. So, um, so my book has these stories, these arguments, um, uh, and these statistics. It's got 50 pages of footnotes, and I hired a professional fact checker to go over every line of my book. Because that's another thing that's happening around the world, these strong men, whether it's Trump here, or Modi in India, or Duterte in the Philippines, or Bolsonaro in Brazil, they're populists, and a populist is basically a gifted storyteller. A populist can tell a false story well, and the only way he can be fought is by telling a true story better. <laughs> so that's why journalists and storytellers, writers, are the populist's number one target. That's why in country after country, they're going after the free press, because we can tell a true story better. Um, I'll leave you with, with, with one happy story and a true story. So, you know, what can we do as immigrants in this country? So after that, after Trump's election, I was really, you know, pretty horribly depressed. But then my brother-in-law, Jay, who's sitting here, uh, he calls me around that time, and he was working for the state treasurer, and he said, so kid, I want to be, I want to run for state senate. And said, in the south? <laughs> with a name like Jay Chowdhury? I said, yeah, I think I can do it. I said, you've never run for office before. And he was running in a district that's 90% white against a man with the fine old southern name of Ellis Hankins. I said, I'm going to run for office. I said, how are you going to support my sister? <laughs> And he said, no, I, I think I've got a shot. And because of his family, I went down and campaigned for him. And my two sons went down and campaigned for him. He'd never run for office before. He had to train his own campaign staff in how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> Chowdhury. <laughs> and Ellis Hankins kind of, I don't know what he did. He may, he may have thought this, the seat was his by divine right. There'd never been an Indian American state senator in North Carolina history. Jay knocked on doors. His campaign knocked on 14,000 doors. He himself knocked on 10,000 doors. And I went door knocking with him. My younger son had a gun pulled on him. This is, you know, it wasn't easy. I had a dog set on me. Although it was a small dog. Uh, <laughs> a poodle named Chewy. <laughs> Chewy, you get back here, Chewy. It's a vicious, those poodles. Um, Poodles and guns notwithstanding, Jay went to these people and spoke to them about what is important for them. Mostly it was about school funding. North Carolina ranked near the bottom in terms of teacher salary. He talked to them about you know, the need to improve public schools, things that mattered to them, local issues. And they didn't care about his last name. They didn't care that he was Bengali or really that he was the son of immigrants. They cared because he spoke to them. Someone put out a picture on Instagram of Jay uh, in the middle of a blizzard, uh, walking into her driveway uh, just over giant mounds of snow to get her vote. And he knocked on 10,000 doors, and he won in a landslide. All politics. <laughs> and I'm proud to say he is uh, not only the first Indian American state senator in North Carolina history. He is now the Democratic whip of the state senate. <laughs> all politics is local, all politics is personal. So this is what we can do as immigrants here. You know, in whatever we do, it, do, it doesn't mean, have to mean running for office. It could be, um, you know, working in an NGO, uh, writing a letter to an editor, um, in storytelling. My mother's family comes from East Africa where, you know, a lot of them were expelled from Uganda because we went to Africa and we stayed as immigrants, but we didn't actively participate in public life. 
I'm sorry to say we actually, many of us thought we were above the Africans. We can't make that same mistake here. We're immigrants, we're here to stay. We might have come as immigrants, but our children were born here, my children were born here. We're Americans, and we're also citizens of the world. In all this back and forth, for a long time in my writing, I've been asking myself, where is home? Is it India, is it America? Well, it is India, it's also America, it's also England, it's also Brazil, it's also France. My home is a palace, it's called the Earth. <laughs>